All right, so thank you all for attending my talk. Uh, it's got an amazing title, which I'm sure grabbed your eye, uh, To Be Announced, Something Something JavaScript, because um, I didn't submit my talk abstract right away. Um, but no, actually, my talk does have a title. Uh, it's actually called The Dialectics of JavaScript. And in fact, I actually mean the dialectics of the web platform. And to a certain extent, I'm kind of glad they didn't print that, because there's a chance you would have heard that and went, Oh, I have no idea what that is. I don't want to go see it. But I assure you, it's something quite interesting, and we'll get into it in just a little bit. Um, but as I was introduced, my name is Ashley Williams. You may know me from the internet as AG Dubs. Uh, I work at this little company called NPM. Yes, it's a company. If you have money, you can give it to us for goods and services. Um, and I also represent the individual membership on the Node.js board of directors. But what I really like to talk about when I talk about technology is how much I really, really love programming languages. Uh, and I'm really honored to be able to be considered an invited speaker at TC39. I got this invite in my uh, Gmail box just a, a couple of weeks ago, and it was pretty fantastic. Uh, and as I was introduced, I also have been working a lot more in this programming language called Rust, which we'll hear just a little bit about later on today. Um, but to kind of follow up from the talk you just heard, uh, I really care about uh, programming languages in underrepresented communities, and so I've started a program called, called RustBridge, uh, where I teach underrepresented people uh, who know another language how to program in Rust, and it's a super fun time. Um, and this all kind of stems from the belief that I really love to think about thinking, particularly the type of thinking that happens when people write code. Now, often I'll use this as an intro to start talking about education, and it's something I'm quite passionate about. But today, I'm going to talk to you about philosophy. So it's going to get a little philosophical. So the title of my talk has this word dialectics in it. Does anybody know what a dialectic is? All right, so great. You're probably all thinking, dia what? <laughs> all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what a dialectic is. A dialectic is a way of reasoning about things. And uh, it's often a little bit easier to understand what a dialectic is when we talk about what it's not. So dialectics are opposed to this idea of formal logic. And so many people who come from a computer science background or a math background are deeply close to this idea of formal logic. And formal logic says that you know things are what they are, and they stand in definite relationships relationships to each other. And this is primarily focused on this idea of the law of identity, which says, if I have a thing, then it is that thing. And when I say it's that thing, I could also very specifically say that it is not another thing. So A equals A, A is definitely not B. But today, we are going to throw this in the bin. Um, because formal logic also tells us that when we reach a contradiction, we are wrong. And today is going to be all about contradictions and how they make us very, very right. So dialectics are primarily focused on this idea that things change over time, which is to say A does not necessarily always equal A. It actually can maintain its identity as it changes over time, and those changes over time are actually what define its identity. So this is an extremely good thing. And we're at a conference called The Future of JavaScript. So we really need to kind of understand what does it mean to be talking about a future, in particular, a future of JavaScript. And what I want to say is JavaScript does not equal JavaScript. In fact, we're going to talk today about how JavaScript changes over time as a result of these oppositions and contradictions that dialectics tell us about. So the dialectical method, in contrast to the method of formal logic, trains us to identify contradictions and thereby get to the bottom of the changes taking place. JavaScript is one of the fastest growing languages. And today, I want to talk about potentially why it is growing so quickly. So one of the main philosophers who came up with this idea is Hegel. Any, any Hegel fans in the house? No, come on. Give it up for Hegel. All right. So Hegel says, every actual thing involves a coexistence of opposed elements. Consequently, to know, or in other words, to comprehend an object, is equivalent to being conscious of the concrete unity 
of its opposed determinations. And so this could sound quite philosophical, but really what I'm talking about here is being, being able to identify something as an object by understanding the contradicting elements that build it together. So this is the kind of formal description of what a, full, uh, a dialectic looks like. You have a thesis and an antithesis in opposition, and then emergent from that opposition is a synthesis. Now this is not a static pattern. Uh, this actually continues to grow. The synthesis that you end up developing then becomes your thesis, and then you have another antithesis, and you continue moving up and forward. And so with this framework, we're now gonna dive into, you're probably sick of the philosophy, we're gonna dive into a little bit of history of the web. Now this talk is extremely short, I didn't realize, and speaking of oppositions, this band is gonna be in opposition to me soon, so you gotta get through this. Um, so this is a very short, totally not even close to complete history of the web platform. All right, so on August 23rd in 1991, the public accessed the very first web page, thanks to Tim Berners-Lee, who's here with an amazing computer right there, and the website sort of looked like this. And obviously, a lot of the websites that we see today don't look much like this, but this very first website didn't even have any JavaScript. It wasn't until four years later in May that Brendan Eich created JavaScript in 10 days. I know many of us know this, but if you forget it, 10 days, give it a break, right? So JavaScript wasn't really used for much during this time. However, over a period of time of the next decade, people started building out much more complex applications in the browser. And in September 2004, a framework called Dojo, which was originally uh, purported by Alex Russell, um, was released and helped us build UIs in the browser to make it a lot more elaborate. And so this was aided by the emergence of Ajax uh, in February 18th, 2005, and really culminated in the release of jQuery in August 26, 2006. So jQuery, as I think we either all know and love or all know and hate, um, was able to make us build really awesome, particularly cross-browser experiences with JavaScript in the client. Now, not yet even a decade later, we see this. You might not need jQuery. Well, well, that's quite interesting. This came out eight years after jQuery happened. And when you see something like that, when you think of how successful jQuery was, you have to ask yourself, well, what the heck happened there? How do we go suddenly from jQuery is amazing to, gosh, we probably don't need it anymore? And so there's a couple of factors at play. One of the factors is web standards. Web standards were during a tumultuous time at the beginning of the web. So in December 1999, ECMAScript 3 was released, and it was, it was pretty cool. But then it, for even like a decade further from that, ECMAScript really struggled, and a lot of the vendor companies within uh, the ECMAScript body and the standards body were really struggling, and in around 2007, 2008, ECMAScript 4 was actually just completely abandoned as a result of this inability to reach consensus. Now, this is around the same time, of course, that we were seeing things like jQuery pop up, and then in June 2015, the vendors were able to finally reach a consensus, and ECMAScript Harmony was released. And so the changes of these standards bodies over time were what the, were the historical forces behind the things that were needed to get us from needing jQuery to not needing it. In addition, we also saw package managers emerge for the first time. In January 12th, 2010, the lovely NPM appeared, though it was primarily for people writing JavaScript on the server. And then in 2012, we saw Bower appear. And so this was also going to be something that was able you to allow you to manage smaller packages instead of the larger jQuery in your client-side applications. And so we see this timeline here, and we can see that from the first public website being accessed to this whole, oh, suddenly we might not need jQuery, there are a lot of different opposing forces at play. And those oppositions actually were what ended up leading to us having ECMAScript Harmony and suddenly this lack of need for the jQuery library. So we can actually see in Google Trends, and we'll talk about Google Trends quite a bit, but it's not scientific data, but it's interesting. Um, so you can see here, interest over time, you can see that jQuery kind of peaks around the time a little bit after it's released, but then as the web coalesces on specific standards and we reach web standardization, we can see interest in it dropping. Now this follows our dialectical pattern because you realize that once you have a synthesis, you're gonna have another antithesis coming up. And we can see here that Angular starts scooping right in as jQuery drops off. 
So part of the thing that I want to talk about when we talk about this is the idea that the browser is actually part of our web application. So we can think of our web application a bit like this iceberg in the ocean. So we have our client-side JavaScript on the top, the browser down deep in the bottom, and of course, server-side JavaScript is the cloud, right? That's classic. Um, <laughs> And you know, kind of classically, we often think of our web app potentially as just this client-side JavaScript. Or maybe you're doing uh, you know, isomorphism, so maybe you combine these together. But I think oftentimes we don't actually consider the fact that the browser's code is actually part of the code in our client-side JavaScript. It's part of our web application. And as we move towards standards and moving more processing into the browser, we're going to be shifting what's on the server, shifting what's on the client, and shifting the work that the browser is able to do. And so I really love the browser, and so I, I often talk about how much I really love compilers. Uh, and so you may be familiar with this amazing compiler. Um. No, it's this one, okay. But this is just one, uh, one of a couple of compilers in the browser that we deal with. Um, but the reason that I love compilers is because developers, us as developers as we build an application, have different needs than computers. We have different needs than our end users have. And so we write code for developers. It's significantly more maintainable. It's often more verbose. Um, but compilers are able to write code for computers. And that code can be much more efficient and ends up giving better performance for our end users, which can be often very good. Um, so what we're seeing here is we need to understand that our application is the server, the client, the browser, and standards. And as we move through the history of JavaScript and into the future, what we're going to see is a shift of responsibilities and privileges among these four players. And it's actually those tensions where I think the most amazing amount of growth is coming from in JavaScript. So now with this, let's talk about a couple of things that I'm particularly excited for in the future. So modules. I work at NPM, right? So I have to talk about modules. Um, so I always like to say when I talk about NPM, I give the big numbers or big talk. Uh -huh. So if you've ever gone to modulecounts.com, you can take a look at the comparison of how many uh, package ecosystems there are with packages inside them. NPM is, of course, far and away the largest package registry uh, on the Earth in the universe. It's hard to say. Um, and while you might agree that there's a bunch of junk in there, I think we all can agree to that, um, there certainly is a lot of amazing things in there. One thing that people actually don't realize, and we've done some analysis on, is that while NPM was originally developed for Node library authors, we are primarily seeing users installing it for writing front-end applications, so much so that we know that 80% of NPM users install use NPM install for front-end dependencies, which is very, very different than what it was originally designed for. And this is a lot of dependencies, all right? Because we have 14 billion downloads in the last month alone. And that number is going up and up and up. Now, I hear this as a developer at NPM, and I think there's a lot of people who are mad at me <laughs> because of this, all right? I never would have believed that people would take this node modules directory and want to pack it up and put it in the browser. <laughs> if someone had told us that, we would have made some different decisions. Um, but here we are. And so there's been a lot of amazing tools that have appeared in order to be able to fix this problem, which is really neat. You may be familiar with some of the ones here. Browserify, Rollup, Closure Compiler, Webpack. And I'd like to focus a little bit on Webpack. How many Webpack users here? All right, I often say that I can't do my job without Webpack existing, because it's very hard to use front-end dependencies or to write a front-end application using NPM without using something like Webpack. And so before I say this, I want to say that Sean Larkin is an amazing human being, and he's a good friend of mine. I'm lucky for that. But sometimes Webpack is confusing. <laughs> All right, and so what I want to ask us today is, well, what would a universe look like where you might not need Webpack? And this is where we come back to those oppositions. What would it be to not need Webpack? And so, of course, I say web standards. All right, so of course, we have this fundamental problem of module formats. Node.js uses CommonJS. Browsers use AMD. But luckily, we have a new standard. Uh, 
called ES6 modules, which I'm particularly very excited about. Yes, the implementation is quite dramatic, and we've had quite a bit of community situations around that, but ES6 modules are super awesome. The fact that they are statically analyzable, so we can do more things like closure compile, uh, the closure compiler, um, they're asynchronous and configurable for loading, uh, and they support cyclic dependencies. I'm particularly excited about ES6 modules. And when you stick ES6 modules with the HTTP2 standard, which has multiplexing and push, we're actually going to be seeing that the bundling, all this build step we had to do before, a lot of that work can get moved to the browser so that we don't have to do it. And I think that that's really quite exciting. So the question is, are we there yet? Well, no, not really. I think we're really kind of in a universe where people are just realizing how complex Webpack is and starting to feel that pain. But I'm hoping that with the adoption and implementation of ES modules across all the browsers and also in Node, um, we're going to be able to be here. and We're going to see a huge decline in the amount of bundling and build steps we have to do. So the next exciting thing I want to talk to you about is WebAssembly. WebAssembly is something that I'm particularly fascinated with. Um, and in order for me to really talk about it, I would have to say, what does web as a platform actually mean? So a platform in general has three things. It has an ISA, instruction set architecture, a runtime, and some tooling to help you build stuff. All right, there are several other types of platforms we could look at. Unix is an example. Java is an example. All right, but what do we think of when we think of the web as a platform? So the web's really weird because it was developed kind of out of order. It has missing pieces. And one of those missing pieces was the instruction set architecture. And so that's where we're able to see WebAssembly plug in a hole that the web as a platform was missing. So I am very excited about this because if you think of single page apps as thick clients, all right, WebAssembly is going to have like the thickest clients imaginable. Um, so here's an example of a game. This is written in assembly. It was ported over from iOS. You can see this here. I'm not going to play it too much, but this is pretty awesome. And this is running. Also, my computer is not connected to the internet, so that's pretty neat. Um, and then additionally, I'm particularly excited because I've been doing a lot of work in Rust, and Rust is, the, uh, is, is working on trying to have like a first class uh, WASM as a target uh, option. And so this is a really awesome uh, demo of doing uh, training a neural network in the browser, not pre-training and then putting it in the browser, actually training it inside the browser, and it's written directly uh, in Rust to WASM, which is super cool. All right, so we're really not anywhere close to seeing this future happen, but I can see it coming. Um, you can see here, even Google Trends didn't really, wasn't even around when Java applets were a thing, but you can see that Adobe Flash is at least dropping off. Um, we see the spas rising, but I'm really hoping to see WebAssembly come into its own uh, very soon, because I think there's a lot of awesome things to do there. All right, so what? Why is that cool? Well, the reason I think WebAssembly is cool is because we can have universal cross-platform applications, this idea of no install necessary. I'm saying you might not need native applications. And so before people get like, oh, well, I can't view source, I can't view source, it only goes, yes, you can view source on WebAssembly. And so this is a bigger, better, opener native application platform, which I think is really exciting. So now I'm going to round this out and see if I can race the band here. All right, so in summary, all right, we can understand things in their essence by examining the contradictions that cause them to change. All right, so that is this idea of the dialectics, and we can hopefully it's not a scary term anymore. Um, dialectics, again, to remember, is the idea of understanding the essence of something and its unity of oppositions. And when we look at the web platform, we see an opposition between the server, the client, the browser, and web standards. And all of those oppositions are the reason that JavaScript is by far the fastest growing language, and why I'm certain that in five years, it will still be the fastest growing language. All right, the history of JavaScript is this series of oppositions, and we as developers actually sit in the middle and are those people who push the synthesis that allows JavaScript to continue to grow. So the web platform is really fantastic. It has kind of these ideas, I like to say that the web platform is both a delivery platform and a computation platform. And so I'm excited about ES modules because this is going to help improve it as a delivery platform, eliminating the need for all the build and bundling work that we're currently doing. And I'm really excited about WASM for web as a computation platform because this is going to change and lessen our needs to actually build, be building native applications.
So I think the future of JavaScript is extremely exciting. However, I get a lot of people who push back at me and say, gosh, JavaScript is so dramatic. Everyone's always arguing, right? And so this is a tweet from my friend Sophia. I would watch Real House Lives, but JavaScript developer drama. Or even Adi Asmani. Someone's describing the, the, sh the American show The Bachelor, all right? This doesn't sound as dramatic as a week in JavaScript, unless they're all node modules. But here's the thing, I don't think JavaScript is dramatic. I think that we have a lot of oppositions right now in our ecosystem, and those oppositions are exciting. So as you spend your time in the conference for the next two days, as you hear people present, I'd like you to take a step back and try and see not just the technology you know, as itself, as a formal logic, but think about the ecosystem within it. Think about the oppositions that created it and the oppositions that it will create in the future. Because those oppositions are the areas for growth that we have, all right? We can think of oppositions as opportunities instead of thinking of them as this dramatic element that's bringing JavaScript down. So the other thing to note is that I'm not talking about oppositions for opposition's sake. Oppositions certainly appear and are a natural part of the ecosystem, but I'm definitely not suggesting this, which Tom is saying, Webpack desperately needs competition. You'll, you'll very quickly discover that I am not a fan of the free market, and I also don't think that the free market is necessarily the best thing for JavaScript. So I say no to this. Instead of looking for more opposition, I think when we find opposition, we should be looking for synthesis. So this is my friend Betsy, and if you get the opportunity, you should read her entire thread on Twitter, because it's fantastic. But we often say, gosh, the web is so complicated now. I want to just build a simple, website, um, and I do too. But the way we do that is not by bashing the tools and the current situation that we're in. Instead, I think a lot of this has to do with building up web standards and evangelizing web standards, because web standards are gonna be that synthesis which allows us all to move the web platform forward. So there's always this question, you know, the future of JavaScript is here. And what I want to say is, when I'm talking about web standards, like to a certain extent, the future of JavaScript is literally like in the building. Go talk to them in the next track. These are people who are building those tools and helping standardize them for us. So that's really, really awesome. But I also have this kind of question, like, is the future of JavaScript here? And so I'm going to round it out with another German philosopher. Here's my buddy Carl. All right, and Carl also talked a lot about dialectics. He said, in the eyes of a dialectical philosophy, nothing is established for all times. Nothing is absolute or sacred. So perhaps I ruffled some feathers when I was like, what would it mean to not need native applications? What would it mean to not need Webpack? This is because we're always seeing things ever grow. And so we're seeing certain things that were once a synthesis of an opposition, then suddenly becoming opposed and moving forward. And I think that that's something that's particularly exciting. However, as we do all of this, all right, I want us to keep in mind that the future of JavaScript is also not evenly distributed. So it's here, but not everybody has access to it. I talked a bit about the web platform as a platform for delivery and consumption. We need to realize that as we make efforts in those directions, there are definitely still people who are not going to be able to access that. Does the, if not everyone can access it, is it truly the future? There are people with extremely low-powered devices. I'm not sure I would necessarily want them to be installing my huge WASM client exactly. Uh, or low bandwidth connections. Do we want to be like, you know, fetching huge bundles and things? And this is something to keep in mind as well. These are other oppositions that exist in the ecosystem and are fascinating and have their own ways that we can grow with them. All right, so when Marx was asked, well, what does the future look for you? What would you imagine that the best future would be, Carl? He goes, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And so as we think about growing radically with the technologies that we have in JavaScript, I want us to keep this in mind. And with this, I'll, I'll end off by saying uh, there is a specter haunting the web platform, the future of JavaScript. Thanks.